Good evening, and welcome to VAMP, yet another virtual one on stage. Okay, this is not a stage. I know that you know that, but you don't know what it is. If you stick around, maybe I'll tell you. My name is Kelly Bowen, and welcome to my first rodeo as a VAMP producer here for the VAMP, that is, first rodeo. VAMP is one of the programs put on by So Say We All, a literary and performing nonprofit based in San Diego, California, whose mission is to help people tell their stories and tell them better. And they do this through three different ways, performance, publication, and education, and anyone can get involved, really, anyone. Please, we want your stories. VAMP loves fresh new voices on their stage. And it is my pleasure with tonight's first rodeo for me to also tell you that it is not just the one or two first rodeo performers for VAMP. We've got five brand new vampers sharing tonight's stage and one veteran performer. Hey, take a moment. There's a link over here. I know there's a link over here. Please donate to So Say We All. I know you're going to love tonight's show. If you already know you're going to love tonight's show, go ahead and donate. It's only five bucks. Give more if you can, if you want to, if you're inspired. Get your friends online. Encourage them to sit down, watch the show with you. Right now, I'd love to be able to say, hey, take that moment, introduce yourself to somebody nearby. But yeah, we're on my state. My, my stage. I know you want to know, don't you? But this is not about me. This is about our performers. So as mentioned, five vamp first timers, one veteran performer. Tonight's performers are Deborah Bass, Joe Levitt, Matthew Vargo, Jen Stiff, the one veteran vamp, Ezra Buck and Dean Ford. And please stick around. Please donate. Please submit. Three months before COVID-19 stopped the world, I broke up with my boyfriend. It was just before Thanksgiving. A silly argument turned a serious corner at whiplash speed and he said he wasn't interested in love. Taken aback, I uttered something that amounted to don't let the doorknob hit you on the way out. My dating profiles were on pause during the relationship, so I decided to start again in earnest after the holidays. 2020 began in a rush. I'd only just started swiping through my online dating accounts when the COVID-19 lockdowns hit. A shameless introvert, happy for the excuse to wear sweatpants all day, order groceries online, and go on a wine-fueled reading binge, I shut everything down again. But after five COVID months, I'd reached my limit of awkward Zoom party, uh, Zoom cocktail parties. I say COVID months because those should be measured like dog years, not regular months. My friend said it was pointless to date. We're in lockdown. But home alone without even a quarantine hostage pet, I was dying to talk to new people. At worst, I thought I might end up with some funny stories. Online dating anecdotes are hilarious. Just ask all of my married friends. At best, I thought I'd get to meet somebody without the stress of, do I kiss him on the first date? Do I invite him inside on the third date? But it's a pandemic. What better time to get to know someone in a chaste but flirty Jane Austen style romance? And maybe, if he was witty and smart and didn't believe that masks were a sign of tyranny, maybe I could find a bona fide COVID boo to shack up with until the world rights itself again. Early on, I was approached by a guy who said he wanted to be obedience trained. Swipe left. Another guy sent me a message asking where I'd taken one of my travel photos. Before I responded, I read his profile he firmly believed in sex positivity and was looking for a confident woman to occasionally discipline him with corporal punishment. And no, he did not need a safe word. 
Next, someone said I was pretty and asked if I was interested in FLR. I asked if that was a band. He said, no, it stands for female-led relationship. I sent him the head scratching emoji and he explained that he wanted me to dominate him. I was propositioned by more than a handful of men who identified as submissives looking for a dominant woman. I politely declined them all and took another look at my dating profile. I mean, what the hell? I read and reread looking for clues but didn't find them. I looked pleasant in photos, I thought. Me, on a colorful blanket in the grass on a bright sunny day for the socially distanced Pilates class that I teach on Saturdays. Me at the beach with a short but not too short jean skirt on. I'm wearing a jaunty scarf. Me at a museum ball in a black dress. Wait, 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 is this it? The dress is one shoulder, a slice removed at the waist, and a provocative slit up the leg. I thought I looked a little awkward attempting to smile with my eyes. But I am in dark lipstick. Well, that must be it. Okay, out with trying to become hither in the party dress, and in with me smiling bright against the mosaic wall of primary colors in La Jolla. I mean, no self-respecting dom is going to be in a photo with this many happy colors. The next guy I talked to did not mention wanting to be controlled, and that suited me just fine. I have enough to do with my own emotional self-control, thank you very much. So we arranged a chat, and all was going well. He said he was into literature and poetry. Nice. The pandemic was hitting him hard. Me too, buddy. He said he wasn't interested in a vanilla relationship. That sounded like a curious phrase to me, but I let it slide until he said it again. You know, who's got time for vanilla? Shit, is this racial? I flash back to the guy who messaged me unashamedly with the words, yummy chocolate cake. So, um, Vanilla, was that his way of not saying chocolate? Uh, what do you mean by vanilla? He explained that, you know, he liked spice in the bedroom. I I'm gonna need more than that. Well, I enjoy swing, he said. Are we talking swing dancing? No. You realize there's a pandemic lockdown, right? I'm, I'm pretty sure the CDC does not recommend that kind of thing. He said that life was too short and he couldn't keep going on like this in quarantine without expressing his true desires. Well, alrighty then. My, look at the time. <laughs> then he asked if I'd heard of hot wifing. I said I had not. What I did not say is that I would be Googling that term immediately after I extricate myself from this call. He said hot wifing would involve his partner being sexually serviced by another person while he watched and she berated him because of his presumed inadequacy. He said some call it cuckolding. I had a million questions, but I figured I'd let Google answer all of them. Even if I was interested, it felt like way too soon to tell the girl you haven't met that you want to see her have sex with other people during a pandemic. I have a hard and fast rule anyway. Any guy that even mentions sex, cuddling, or great kisser in his profile is swipe left material because he's probably not interested in my Jane Austen plan. I looked at my profile again. I guess I'm going through a bad streak? I mean, dating, it's a numbers game, right? Okay, another guy, another phone date. We get through the whole first phone call and first Zoom date without talk of me dominating anyone. Streak is over. So I share a few funny stories from my Dom courting suitors. He's not laughing. I thought maybe my delivery was off. 
I mean, can you believe it took me this many years to hear the word cuckold? <laughs> Sounds like something out of Dickens. I know the term, he said. Well, you've clearly read more Dickens than me. He said, I'm also someone who identifies as a submissive and finding a dominant woman for a loving female-led relationship is very important to me. I had no idea how to say, not that there's anything wrong with that. After I pretty much just said that I thought there was something wrong with that. Before I could fake a bad internet connection and end the video feed, he explained that he wasn't offended much. He asked what I knew, what I didn't, and what I was curious about. Hmm. So, you're not into the lick my boots type dominatrix? Hmm. Teasing? That sounds cute. <laughs> Wait, what, what is orgasm control? And yes, to being tied up. <laughs> oh no, <laughs> you don't have to go into <clears throat> the details. He said that he included hints in his profile about his preferences. He said he used the word mischievous on purpose. It sounded innocuous to me at the time, but suddenly I thought that was definitely a red flag. If I'd read a profile with the word naughty or bad girl instead of mischievous, my spidey senses would have tangled. But I was so impressed by his use of complete sentences that I thought mischievous was an attempted dry wit. And he did have a dry wit. He made me laugh. So we arranged to talk again and it went nicely. He's easy to talk to and well-informed about history and politics and world events. It felt very much like the forming of a friendship. He made me feel comfortable. So, um, there's something I need to ask. What am I missing in my profile that seems to attract guys that want to be dominated? He laughed and I worried that I had missed something super obvious and I was on some fetish website with the directive, message her for a good time. He said, that's the thing. I looked at your profile again and I couldn't find a hint that you might be a dominant. Your profile is very sweet, which doesn't mean that you couldn't be a dom, but I have a theory. You're tall. Excuse me? I mean, I'm five foot ten and bare feet, but I have never been a sub magnet before in my life. He wasn't done. I've noticed something on the dating apps and didn't put it together until you. There's a higher percentage of women in their 40s who are tall on the apps compared to tall 40 something women on average. Wait, what? A higher percentage of tall women in their 40s are single because small-minded, and by mind I mean dick, men can't handle the height differential? It drives me insane that even basketball players like petite women, which is like, come the F on, you're a giant. I think you can date a woman who doesn't have to justify being tall enough to go on the advanced rides at Disneyland. His smile widened as I ranted because apparently he liked me when I was a little angry. But that doesn't make me a dom, you know. Being tall? It doesn't, he said. But I think the difference is that subs don't discriminate against tall women. The implication and the irony that conversely I as a tall woman had been discriminating against submissive men was not lost on me. Where does the line of preference versus discrimination lie on the dating spectrum anyway? So it's not exactly Jane Austen, but 
Me and the last sub still talk regularly about politics and literature and sex. And all of my dating profiles are still active because it's probably true that everyone on a dating app is a little masochistic. Greg was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease on the very day he retired. I'd been living in Australia for eight years when we met. He was an associate professor at the University of Sydney where he worked in curriculum development for the School of Medicine and the School of Pharmacy. I thought he was the smartest guy in the room and found his intellect and confidence disarming. He was quiet, modest, and measured next to me the loudmouth, blunt, and loquacious American. Whenever I speak before thinking, he likes to say, well, there's another one for your tombstone, to which I generally reply, I'm tired of being the smart one. I want to be the pretty one. Truth is, I was neither. With Parkinson's, things become progressively smaller and slower like handwriting, balance, voice, smell, facial expression, and thought processes. Falls are common. When I struggle with these changes, it's the thought of Greg slowly receding from me that scares me the most. I hoped I'd have the strength to be there for him as he'd always been there for me. I'd seen people I deeply love recede before when I coordinated care for my parents' dementia. I begged them to come to Australia for years where I could look after them, but they were unwilling to leave everything they'd known. Greg helped me manage the tyranny of distance by helping set up social worker visits, Skype calls, and care conferences. My parents adored him. Even through their dementia, they always knew who he was. He'd made many visits with me to see them, forsaking more exotic destinations for beautiful Cherry Hill, New Jersey. He even brought them to Australia to visit us. We married in 2012 in America, long before it was legal in Australia, and my parents threw the reception. On one visit to their nursing home, I watched Greg brush mom's hair. She protested, but soon made contented sounds and fell asleep. I was moved by this profoundly. We've never been a touchy-feely family, but on the next day, Greg insisted I brush her hair. It was an intimate, tactile, caring gesture, and I brushed her hair every day after. Though shell-shocked by his diagnosis, Greg acted decisively. He immediately enrolled in Parkinson's classes, combining exercise with cognitive tasks. Exercise suppresses symptoms and makes life more manageable. While watching Greg in one of these classes bounce a ball while counting backwards by sevens, a thought struck me that I might achieve the same thing by asking him to dance. I had learned to partner dance in nightclubs during the disco era from my friend Robert, a legendary street dancer. He encouraged me to audition for a ballroom dancing job and I ended up teaching for a decade. I can still hear his mantra, this is your life, not the dress rehearsal. He lived a fiercely confident life and experienced everything on the menu. Robert was the first friend I lost during the AIDS crisis in the 80s. Greg was not the ferociously confident dancer Robert was. In our first dances together in our living room, he was reluctant, clumsy. He cut the first few sessions short, obviously frustrated, but eventually he relaxed. He still feigned impatience, but I could see him enjoying it. Eight weeks into it, the Sydney Gay and Lesbian Choir advertised for same-sex ballroom dancers, saying enthusiasm is more important than skill or expertise. Though quite reserved, Greg agreed to participate in the choir's stage show, Cheek to Cheek. Performing to a large audience appealed to Greg more than performing for an audience of our three dogs. We made new friends and shared our dancing with everyone who attended. I wish my parents could have been there. In her youth, mom performed in amateur theater 
and once even got Dad to join her in a show that I attended. She loved dance and was so proud of me becoming an instructor. Even in their 90s, she and Dad did seated dance classes in the nursing home. After Cheek to Cheek, we entered some local same-sex ballroom competitions and even featured in a commercial for home insurance that focused on Greg's Parkinson's and how our dancing helped maintain his functional mobility. We eventually attended a large international competition in Florida. I'd choreographed a solo routine for us to Love You I Do from Dreamgirls as a special gift. It was a labor of love and Greg put everything into learning it. Seeing him in his tuxedo, I thought he'd never looked more dashing. Dance had improved his posture, movement, and confidence. Thankfully, his Parkinson's was progressing slowly. In 2017, there was a renewed push for marriage equality in Australia and the public debate was divisive. Hate-filled misleading posters were put up around town, pro-equality materials were vandalized, and homophobic graffiti appeared. We attended rallies and protests, donated what we could, and signed petitions. Following a call out from the Yes campaign, we wrote a letter to Parliament sharing our experience with discrimination in Greg's retirement pension. Greg feared that if he died first, I wouldn't be legally recognized as his retirement beneficiary. The pension required extensive and intrusive proof of our relationship that was not required of married couples. He asked me to help him gather and submit these in advance, but the pension repeatedly refused them. How can they get away with this, Greg asked, pacing angrily. With each bureaucratic paperwork defeat, I threw documents and swore loudly. Anger had increasingly turned to feelings of powerlessness and defeat, but the marriage equality debate had breathed new life into our resolve. We channeled this renewed energy into the letter to our parliamentary representative. But tragedy put this battle for equality on hold. My father had passed away. I wrote his eulogy on the plane, thinking about showing him the video of our Love You, I Do routine just weeks earlier. Mom slept through the funeral, something I knew to be a coping mechanism, but was no less excruciating to watch. Later, she told me my friend died. I brushed her hair, thinking I'd never heard her say anything more intimate. On my return, Greg said that our letter to Parliament had led to a call from the ABC asking us to appear on their current affairs show, The 730 Report. Our dancing and his Parkinson's had somehow come up in the conversation and they wanted to use it. I was reluctant. I feared a backlash that could stain our dancing. To me, the issue was the pension inequality. The thought of someone calling Greg an old dancing queen on the street or worse was horrifying. Greg said he'd spent too much of his life kowtowing to bullies and thought it was important to do what we could. The segment aired in September and I was proud to dance with him on our national broadcaster. Parliament ultimately changed the Marriage Act to include same-sex couples. We watched the result live on TV with friends. It was hard to breathe. We screamed, we cheered, we cried. I felt a combination of adrenaline-fueled excitement and an exhausted release of tension that had built for months. A group of us went out to dinner and drank way too much. We had a table on the street and our community was out in force. Knowing glances, smiles, and cries of yes accompanied the meal. After this, we again submitted our re relationship documents to Greg's pension. This time, the response was much quicker. It said in part, based on the documentation provided, if the relationship is continuous up to the date of Mr. Ryan's death, Mr. Levitt would be approved as the eligible spouse we wouldn't expect that we would need to request any additional documentation. Our dancing had played a role in the win. Greg felt relieved and vindicated, but through our victories, 
the effects of Parkinson's remained with us. Greg told me he'd been hallucinating, but had kept it to himself. We were in bed and he whispered to me, there was a woman on the couch. He said to be quiet so she wouldn't hear us. I stared at the ceiling until morning. I became familiar with a recurring cast of characters that shared our home. One day I was shopping when Greg phoned in a panic. The orange woman was in the house. He said she was screaming, I'll kill you, I'll kill you. He spoke of a boy on the balcony with a knife and described a smell of rot and decay in the air. I stayed on the phone with him until I arrived home to find him in the back bedroom having barricaded himself in with the sofa. I drew a bath and sat with him until he was calm. It turned out one of Greg's drugs had set off the hallucinations. By Christmas, thankfully, they were gone. During this time, a nurse familiar with our history said, dance with him. It occurred to me that we hadn't danced together in months. So just as it started years before, we began dancing together in our living room. It was intimate, tactile, and caring, just like brushing someone's hair. It brought a joy and normalcy to an upside down world and reminded us we were there for each other. We don't know what lies ahead, but we dance. Thank you. The last apartment, tall ceilinged, barrel hinged windows, stained glass, really the one this queer boy wanted to move into. Could the leasing agent have known? As we knocked and then knocked once more, that I had hoped to turn something bitter about myself over in the sunny to open rooms just beyond the door. A moment passed, like the pause before a kiss and the agent slid her key inside the lock before we heard a rushed holler hitting down the hall. One moment, a man's voice. The leasing agent and I exchanged humorous eyes. We indulged a few whispers. In the excited way I used to stay up late with friends, no one wanting to fall asleep. We each in each other's confidences. Then the tenant issued his embarrassed permission. Come in. Inside, I saw a woman and a man in movie-like dishevel. Bra on the bed, gray sweats. An unattended throb followed the man as he turned from us and we each avoided talking too much, sparing a couple comments on traffic and noise. Now, I think about the tenant's cock often. I think about her in the room, a midday throw about my age, but they seem innocent compared to me. There is a space between my fall down booze driven lust, the way I wipe and wipe at these dark little trinkets of nights with men, look at me out and proud. I'm still a shame filled space. I think his penis is much more pure and deserving than mine. And when I think of this, it barely goes beyond reporting. Still, I took the apartment. By the time I turned 14, my friends had already started getting boobs and Frenching boys. And I had yet to grow into my Calvin Klein training bra and hadn't said a word to a boy who wasn't my brother. The only changes I noticed in my body were happening above the neck. The top half of my hair had burst into a mass of thick frizzy curls like a cloudy brown halo, while the bottom half remained stick straight and silky smooth. I had so much acne that my face looked not like a pepperoni pizza, but just the pepperoni. I had spent my childhood as a competitive gymnast, meaning that I could do more pull-ups on the monkey bars than all the boys combined, and that my body looked like that of a bull terrier. By my 15th birthday, my classmates, my friends, my dance team, my neighbors, my mom's friends' daughters, and my brother's friends' sisters had all started their periods. 
The only other late bloomer in the whole city was another former gymnast named Dina Van Lirup. We both joined my dance team at the same time, but had nothing in common aside from our athletic builds and propensity to doing unsolicited back handsprings after dance rehearsal. While I wanted nothing to do with her, adults stuck us together constantly, the two outcasts who would not bleed. We were partnered up in dance routines, on school projects, and even in carpools. Maybe our moms thought we'd feel more comfortable being with our own kind, but actually the pairing was a cruel reminder that we didn't fit in. I wanted nothing more than to be like the other girls. Every night before dance class, my teammates huddled together on the black vinyl studio floor to exchange stories about having to run to the restroom in the middle of Spanish class because they noticed a red spot on their jeans or to let us know they were just gonna watch that night's rehearsal because of cramps. As they bonded over their newfound womanhood, I sat in silence, too ashamed of being different to participate in the conversation. At 16, my period still hadn't shown up. Week after week, I'd revisit the 10 signs your period is coming checklist in 17 magazine with only one check mark to my name, acne. I lay awake in bed at night, wondering when Punky Brewster's menses had started. I prayed for my cat Spooky to live forever and for my period to come. But no matter how hard I tried to coax my body into bleeding, I remained a little girl. My mom and my grandma whispered about my delayed development over the cordless phone at night. On top of the shame and isolation I felt, I couldn't help but wonder if something was gravely wrong with my body that maybe all those years of high-impact hip banging against the uneven parallel bars had caused permanent ovarian disfigurement. But my mom didn't take me to the doctor or discuss the matter with me, beyond reassuring me that my body wouldn't look like Mary Lou Retton's forever, and that I'd probably be all caught up by the time I started college. Eventually, my anxiety about my stunted growth became so tectonic that I forced myself to stop thinking about periods altogether. In fact, I had compartmentalized it so well that when I got home from ballet class one night shortly after my 17th birthday and found a tiny dot of sticky brown fluid in my pink cotton panties, I was stunned into a state of menstrual inertia. I couldn't tell my mom or a friend or a dance teacher or anybody and instead began to hide the blood and DIY my menstrual products. I wore black pants to school. I stuffed wads of Charmin Ultra into my panties and stole maxi pads from underneath my mom's bathroom sink. These pads were fucking enormous. I washed my panties in the sink before they hit the laundry. I hid the maxi pad wrappers deep in the trash can. Homesteading a period would have worked just fine, except I was a competitive dancer in the 90s and my costumes were inspired by the semi-nude backup dancers in Paula Abdul videos. There was no way I was going to hide an apocalyptic pad bulge underneath a black pleather rhinestone studded bikini bottom the size of a Snickers wrapper. So I feigned illness or injury if I woke up in the morning of a dance competition and found blood in my panties. For a full year, not one person knew I had become a woman. I had convinced myself that if the other girls found out, they'd make fun of me, and I couldn't endure more social isolation than I already felt. Dina Van Lirup had long since gotten her first period, after me, and to my horror, told everyone about it. Now I was truly alone and planned to hide my period until I could go to college and forge a new identity. But the bleeding had started to become more regular, more predictable, and heavier. One Saturday afternoon, I was struck by a sudden urge to confess to my mom that my time of the month had been coming for many months. I stood at the top of the staircase and called down to my mom, who was stirring a pot of spaghetti in the kitchen. She walked out of the kitchen, one hand holding a wooden spoon, the other hand on her hip, in a hurry to get back to cooking. I declared my womanhood in a shaky, raspy whisper, my words deflating as they fell down the stairs toward my mom, and I had to repeat myself several mortifying times. Mom, I'm like, you know, needing to ride the cotton horse. What, honey? I need to put a mouse in my house, if you know what I mean. What, honey? I can't hear you. Mom, Aunt Flo, I... Honey, the water's gonna boil over. What on earth is going on? There's blood in my underwear. I had dreaded this moment for 12 excruciating months, 
painstakingly hiding my period and reusing the same monster pads for several days at a time to avoid this very moment. Her face flushed. My mom walked back into the kitchen and told my dad he had to finish making the pasta because she had to go to Vaughn's because Jen had started her period. Finally. She called my grandmother first. I did not leave my room the rest of the afternoon, evening, or next morning. My mom left two pink boxes on my bathroom counter, one with pads about the thickness of a plus-size Hershey bar and a box of Slender for Teens tampons. When I finally emerged from my room the next day and sat down at the kitchen table to eat a cheese sandwich, my mom, unable to meet my eyes, asked if I'd tried the tampons. Mom, no, I think it was a false alarm. Maybe the red tide didn't arrive after all. Okay, well, try the tampons and see how they feel. Just don't do what my friend Judy did and forget you put one in there and then put another one in the next day and forget about that one too. And three weeks later, you end up in urgent care in unimaginable pain, only to have a young male doctor fish out two three-week-old tampons and then have to get treated for three types of infections. From the start, pads seemed like the more appealing option. I had no understanding of my anatomy, where each hole started and stopped, or how they functioned as a team. I feverishly studied the diagram on the teen Tampax box, trying to visualize the subterranean architecture of my womb. But I couldn't make sense of how the main cavern branched off into subcanals and microchannels, or why this was relevant information when the tampon clearly sat at the entrance. I cautiously grazed the exterior of my vagina with my fingertips and could not conceive of how something could possibly squeeze inside of it. I tore open dozens of tiny tampon wrappers, pushing, sweating, squeezing, clenching, and finally lying on the bathroom floor in tears, defeated and ready to quit the dance team that was my whole life. I knew I had to find a way to get that sucker up there, come hell or high water. I spent the next few days holed up in my bedroom sticking random objects into my vagina, objects narrower than tampons, thinking I could work my way up in size. I had finally located the correct orifice, but there was a flap of skin stretching over it, and I thought in all likelihood I was deformed. I would not only have to quit dance, but also there was no way a penis was going in or a baby was coming out, ever. This caused me great concern, but I remembered what my mom always told me in difficult times. If you set your mind to it, anything is possible. The smallest tampon shaped object I could find in my room was a Lisa Frank glitter pencil. And by means of contorting my body into every conceivable shape, I found I could access the right hole if I lay down on my back, drew my knees into my chest, and consciously relaxed my pelvic muscles. In went the glitter pencil. Not very far, just past the eraser, but I was proud of the progress I had made. I even joined the family that night for Little Caesar's pizza and breadsticks. The next day I repeated the exercise with a more sensible object, a Q-tip. Bingo, I could get it all the way in. After the Q-tip achievement, I was unstoppable. Every object I saw around the house that mimicked the shape and size of tiny tampons was fair game. I spent a month practicing every day with a tube of Revlon cherries in the snow lipstick, a Tootsie Roll with the wrapper on, and a wad of gauze. Until finally one Sunday morning, I got into position on my bed, implored my vagina to relax, and pushed the dainty tampon all the way in. I was so relieved that I left it in until bedtime, when I remembered the label on the box warning of toxic shock syndrome. Thus began my tepid relationship with tampons. Once I understood that menstrual products required as much care as an infant, my shame was replaced by fear. Would I leave it in too long and die of an infection? What if the string got lost and I had to have the tampon surgically removed? Or worse, what if the audience saw the string poking out of my leotard while I did the splits during a dance performance? Of course, I didn't confide in my friends because they all still thought I was a child. Besides my mom, who probably told all the other moms, I never told anyone I had started my period. Not even my best friends, Annie or Bethany, who had moved past period drama and were already onto their first pregnancy scares. My mom's words about being caught up by the time I went to college stuck with me. Underneath those words was a deeper understanding that I would leave behind the horrors of being a teenage girl 
and start a new life as a young woman. In the fall of that year, my mom helped me pack my room into the back of her red Jeep Cherokee and drove me to college. I walked into my freshman dorm room with my extra long twin sheet set, a Bob Marley poster, and several boxes of menstrual products. For the first time, I finally felt like I fit in. That is, of course, until three weeks later when it became apparent I was the only virgin in the entire dormitory. Sometimes I still wish I was a girl. Even though I've spent so much time and energy and money on becoming a man. The truth is that I love girls. I love being kind and colorful and expressive like the dozens of women who have nurtured me. I remember staring at myself in the mirror with my binder on under my most beautiful dress. It was a simple A-line shape, blue with white polka dots on the skirt. The fabric was a thin polyester, a cheap fast fashion thing I had ordered just a few months before I came out. I went through an Audrey Hepburn phase, just after I cut my hair short, but before I got a binder that worked. I looked, in a word, ridiculous, like a little boy getting into his mother's makeup. It was not the dress, nor was it the binder, but somehow the combination of them that felt like fire ants on my skin. Everywhere fabric touched, burned, stung, shocked my nerves. Every heaving breath I took only intensified all of the feeling. But I so loved that dress that I swallowed my feelings and went to the theater anyway. The first time I beheld my flat chest, Hazy from anesthesia, I felt an elation you could only dream of. It is impossible to describe the feeling of being comfortable for the first time, like trying to describe a color without using its name. And for a long time, I was afraid of my dresses, my skirts. I was afraid of being called something I wasn't, or pretending to be something I wasn't. Insecure, perhaps, or tired, ashamed of the questions and the looks and the rocks and the possibility that hung in the air when I boarded my 1 a.m. bus home after work, all alone. A friend once said, I feel a kinship with women, though I myself am not one. The F on my birth certificate aligns me with them, as does the anxiety I feel alone in a crowded bar, even though in my new body I can move seamlessly from one expression to the other, mammed at the grocery store, served by the car salesman. Who I am changes on the place more than my clothes, a stand-in for their expectation more than personal reality. I am ignored by men on the prowl, and I hold my friends' drinks when they go to dance. They do not fear me. They know I will not bend their will to mine. But strangers do not cross the street when we are walking the same way at night. We carry our keys in the same hand, regardless of the boots, the blouse, and the skinny jeans. The lesbians who love women and are and are not women, who occupy the space not between here and here, but rather off the page altogether. I am not them. I am assuredly here, so much as here is, though others confused may see my reflection. But I and they have more in common than I with any other man. And now, locked in my house, three rooms with no view, with no way else to decide where on the page I fit or ought to, I lounge in shift dresses and cottage skirts and pink and white over boxer briefs with too much space in the front. And God, I am so comfortable.
After graduating from Navy boot camp in early 2013, I attended the introductory A school for aviation technician training. For this story, know that a bathroom isn't a bathroom, it's a head. That you live in barracks, not in apartments or dorms. You live in fear of surprise room inspections where you're not landlord and you're not RA can make you do push-ups if they find dust behind the refrigerator. Your roommate is your bunkmate. The neighbors which share your head are your headmates. Your last name, your first name, your rate, aka your job, is told an acronym, as there's no better way to encompass somebody's identity than in shorthand. Being an AT meant you tested better than an AE, both of whom are smarter than an AO, who'd only stay a month in A school before shoving out to handle actual bombs. Uh, but don't confuse the A in AT, AE, and AO with the A in A school. That A doesn't stand for anything. That A is just to mark a beginning. A platter of oysters sits beneath the sunburnt face of my bunkmate Rhodes. He keeps telling me between slurps how oysters are an aphrodisiac as I brush my leg against his. He grabs a lemon half and plucks out the seeds, grinding the pulp. Down the road a bit, he says, there's a cove that leads to the bay, good place to snorkel. I listen and nod, but I don't want to snorkel, despite having already paid $30 for snorkeling supplies which are sitting in the back of my car. What I want out of roads keeps me busy when I should sleep. Busy reading into the motion of our bunk bed, staring into the shifting shadows waiting for an invitation. I can better serve myself getting shit-faced to abandon him and go back to the Hilton Inland and day drink before going out to Pensacola's one gay bar. When any of us go off base, it's rare to be alone. Our petty officers encourage it for accountability, saying it's less likely for some embarrassing incident to happen when your shipmate is with you. Although, the only accountability that I've ever found here is making sure the bottles are empty by the end of the night. Think about it this way. You don't join the military because it's your first choice. You either have the kind of life you want to escape or are the type of person that needs constraints to even you out. Most of the new enlistees are fresh out of their parents' house. Then boot camp happens, and we're deprived of simple freedoms, cut off from society. We leave boot camp more wound up than ever, and when we're set loose, we've little in the way of inhibitions, and I am no exception. Joining the Navy, let me escape the Bible Belt and my pray the gay away parents. We can't drink in the barracks, so we have hotel parties, piling in as many bodies as possible. Because I'm still underage, I, living off the liquor of strangers is my go-to. Last weekend, I got Everclear from our headmate. I found a black sharpie and wrote XXX across the label, taking shots from the bottle like I was some cartoon farmer. I sat alone with it after the party had died, pretending it's straight gasoline, staring into the night, listening to Bjork, taking deep drags from my southern cut cigarettes in the smoker pit outside our barracks. We finish eating and Rhodes insists on paying. He walks up to the bar and starts waving a $10 bill at the bartender who is rushing back and forth under neon signs. I wait outside in the salty humidity and start to smoke. My smoke blends in with the brutalist gray of the restaurant. A family walks toward the entrance, fanning the air. I hold the door open for them. A man reaches out his hand to me and says, thank you for your service. I press my lips together in a smile and nod. Even in our civvies, we're easy to spot. Rhodes walks out and grabs my shoulder, leading me to the car. It's about a five minute drive away from the boardwalks, but it's so quiet. Besides the few sailboats in the bay, it's just me and Rhodes. He points to the 20 story condos eclipsing the left half of the sky, whose shadow encroaches over the shore. No one actually lives there, he assures me. They built those things so quick I wouldn't be surprised if a hurricane rolled through and it all just blew over. Rhodes is pulling out the snorkel bags, black fish net sacks holding the red rubber fins and obviously the snorkels. I peel off my white tank top and take down my sweat shorts, revealing even shorter swim shorts. Shorts so short I keep checking if, to see if I've spilled out of them. The breeze... The sun, the blatant exhibition, I feel good, I look good. 
stretching and twisting my muscles like springs wound round me. I rubbed sunscreen down my abs, already slick with sweat. Rhodes watches me undress before stripping down himself, revealing even more sunstruck skin. I take the chance to press my hand against him, watching the color change from white to red again. He presses his palm onto my chest, then releases, comparing our flush. I shove off to the water as my feet begin to burn. The tide paints the shore at each turn. My skin matches the silky mud. I sit, legs stretched flat in front of me, sinking into it and shoveling handfuls onto my lap. I press the sand down my legs, covering the giant tattoo on my thigh, matting the hair and scraping the skin till I get to my toes and wiggle it into each crease. Rhodes puts the snorkels down and joins me, repeating the ritual till we're both buried, two torsos sticking out of the sand. He grabs my hand and buries it into his lap, and I can feel his heart beating blood into him. We stay like this for some time, silent, looking away from each other, letting the sand swallow us whole. One by one, my friends are scattered across the globe, ejected from my life. Rhodes is gone, just another ember in the flame of my love life. I stand at the end of my nine-month stay in Pensacola, in a room with a dozen other ATs reading our new orders. Mine is with helicopters, Blackhawks in Norfolk, Virginia. I get to go home for a couple of weeks before mo moving to Virginia. Ten-hour drive back to Houston in my 2006 Nissan Altima with no AC that's packed to the brim with my shit. I'm alone in Alabama and Mississippi. I'm alone in Louisiana, too. I'm alone waiting for my religious parents to get the door. Stranger to here and to there. My memories hang like picture frames, dusted with longing. My mind is fogged with lust and liquor and loss. Oh! Hey, cool! You stuck around! Thank you so much. Well, actually, I know why you stuck around. You stuck around because this was an amazing night of performances. We had such a lovely diversity of, of poignant and funny and poetry. And it was just such an, an amazing experience for me to get to work with these wonderful writers and performers who brought such talent and such positive energy to our stage. Again, to give you their names, we had Deborah Bass, Joe Levitt, Matthew Vargo, Jen Stiff, Ezra Buck, and Dean Ford. And I'd like to throw out a shout out to our coaches and mentors who took their time to help these performers come to their utmost peak performance. Louise Jolig, Eileen Zimmerman, and Jennifer Coburn, Heidi Hanselman, Brent Hanafi, Carly Krishmar, Brandy Dykusen. Oh, and back to Brent, donate or Brent's gonna come after you. You know, he does that, right? Like he he totally will do that. Well, I mean, I don't, I don't know what other than I've seen him do it, but I, I donate. You do, please donate. We, we want to keep Vamp alive. Vamp brings us all so much joy and tears and laughter and and all the things and please do submit the next vamp is on february 25th and i know you got stories i know you got stories for this prompt the prompt is dirty talk super spreader so bring them on we want to hear your juicy stories please go to the website so say we all online.com check out all of the prompts check out long stories short and get your work in Please keep showing up. We all hope to be back in community sooner than later, but in the meantime, stay safe. Do all the things you know you're supposed to be doing and keep writing and keep submitting and keep on being the amazing people you all are. Okay, you stuck around, so guesses, guesses, guess. It's a yoga rope wall. I don't know what you people were thinking. Just because I mentioned dirty talk. God, thank you and good night.